Very good. Welcome everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and I'm pleased to have you join me today. This is a, one of my favorite topics and from the looks of the attendance we've got over 100 people now. Um, it's a popular one from around the uh, at least the eastern part of the country. So we're gonna be talking about woodlot and forest regeneration, focusing in on barriers and strategies. This is a presentation that I put together with Brett Chedzoy, who's a colleague uh, with me through Cornell University Cooperative Extension. Brett's a regional extension forester and manager of the Arnott Forest, where I serve as director and Brett resides and works primarily out of Schuyler County, but um, works serves a, uh, a region-wide area of cooperative extension. So we're going to, th we're thinking about our, primarily our eastern hardwood forests, and these are beautiful forests. Um, you all are familiar with these. We have a diversity of species in the overstory, and they provide for us um, a great variety of services and values from economic value to emotional value to aesthetic values to ecosystem services and the question though is as these forests mature which they are maturing um, are they going to be reproduced and are we going to continue to get the same kinds of values from them that we have grown to know and love In New York, at least, and I think this is uh, not uncharacteristic of many of the forests in the east, certainly in the mid-Atlantic uh, region, maybe less so in the far north and less so in the far south, but we're seeing that these forests are changing and that uh, we need to intervene on many fronts, as says here by the New York State DEC Forest Resource Assessment Report, uh, or the values and the amenities that we're uh, interested in are not going to be available in the future. And we had anticipated this. Um, other people, many people have been studying this actually for decades. Uh, we took, uh, we some folks and colleagues at Cornell took a look at this where we surveyed foresters and we asked them about their perceptions of how uh, forests were regenerating. And the statewide average uh, shows that only 30% of the areas that foresters looked at uh, that they thought would that they thought should be regenerating are successfully regenerating. So by that I mean highly or moderately successful. So these were this was not a field survey, this was a human dimension survey of foresters and we asked them where you've recently been, where there should be regeneration, are you seeing that regeneration? And in the majority of cases, 70% of the cases it was either only marginally successful or a complete failure. At the same time, um, a group from the Nature Conservancy, Rebecca Shire and Chris Zimmerman, looked at forest inventory and analysis plot data and uh, graphed the regeneration index, as you see on your screen, for desirable timber species. And there are two, if you look at this report, there are actually two uh, two maps that they show. This one is of desirable timber species. They have another one that's of canopy species that doesn't have as much red and orange in it, so it looks it's a more favorable image, but that includes species like American beech that would not typically be desirable species. So their, uh, their uh, analysis similarly reflected a significant portion of the state that has a lot of problems with regeneration. So many areas in Southern Tier, uh, significant areas in the Catskills and the Lower Hudson, kind of the southeast part of the state, and even uh, significant parts of the Adirondacks, although there are areas that are having successful regeneration, there are areas with a lot of problems. So this sets the stage for the fact that we need to talk about what are the problems that are causing uh, failures or anticipated failures in regeneration. So today I want to talk about the ecology of regeneration. I'll identify some risks and concerns, and these are going to be uh, certainly not 
uh, localized concerns and risks, uh, which you may have on your property or on properties that you manage. There'll be more statewide averages or general trends. We'll identify the barriers. Uh, we'll look at some different ways to establish trees. So how do we solve the problems? And then talk about uh, protecting seedlings. So I've shown a couple of pictures in the upper frame. You see red oak and sugar maple, and there's probably some other species in there. And the lower picture is a picture of an old field stand at the Arnott Forest that just wants to grow sugar maple, although they never quite get very tall. Go figure. We'll talk about that. So the first part of the story is recognizing that in the Northeast, a lot of um, northeast where you have sunlight you're going to have woody plants. Uh, this picture illustrates uh, an illuminated section of an old skid trail that's regenerated well to eastern white pine and it's just capturing the fact that where you have sunlight and you put sunlight on the ground plants are going to grow there. But then also when you look at the picture and you think about what's happening in, in areas where you've been you start asking yourself questions such as when I'm trying to regenerate the forest, how many seedlings do I need? Is there a density of seedlings per acre that's a, a magic threshold or a desired threshold? And, and there is. Um, and then when do we need those seedlings to exist? So if we have an immature forest and we're doing tending activities or thinning activities, we probably don't need to be thinking about regeneration as much as we do as when the forest is maturing and we're doing a regeneration harvest. You think about when you look at uh, all of those seedlings, they're essentially all white pine and you recognize there are other species in the mixture of this forest that is pictured. What's the variety of species, the diversity of species, and the match of the species in the understory relative to the species in the uh, match between understory and overstory species. So if we don't have an adequate number of stems, if we don't have the right variety of species, what are the barriers to establishing seedlings and encouraging them to grow so that we have to not only get them to germinate, we have to get them established and survive and then grow and then recruit them into larger diameter classes. So if there are complications in that process, what actions are necessary? Most of you though are probably thinking that we have some plant species that don't require very much light. Um, hang on, I need to move my, if I can move this, there we go, sorry. So there are plants that don't need light. I've illustrated two examples. We have multiflora rose and we have American beech. Um, these are species in the list here are species that would typically be considered interfering in that they can gain dominance in the understory and by their presence and the shade that they cast, the filtering of light, they preclude or limit the ability of other desirable species to establish. Usually you don't have all of these species on your property. Some of you do, I know. And uh, typically what I see is there are a few that dominate and there are uh, others that are just scattered individuals, but they can all be problematic. So we have sunlight is a key issue, but then there's this, there's sunlight from the overstory openings, and then there's also sunlight that's present or not present on the ground layer. And the, the lower picture with American beach and the shade that you see there illustrates the amount of shading that can occur on the forest floor, even though as this picture seems to appear, there's sunlight above the beach layer. We can, we can uh, step back a little bit and say, why do we need to think about desirable regeneration? We go all the way back to the uh, 1800s, when we had a lot of agriculture on the landscape, this was post-European settlement. Uh, agricultural lands dominated the Northeast in New York. Agriculture dominated, was peaked rather, in the 1880s and would be similar to that in states to the East and to the West and to the South, although not identical. And then agriculture started to decline. Uh, there were uh, demographic shifts that precipitated this. And by the early 1900s, 
there were young forests that were growing up and starting to establish on many of these abandoned agricultural lands. So we don't need to think about uh, you know, regeneration happening in the early 1900s because it had already occurred. All those additional agricultural lands were abandoned, those then also became forest land. By the mid to late 1900s, we had uh, considerable acreages in our eastern states that were maturing forests. And as those forests mature, some of them are going to be harvested. So that's why we need to be thinking about regeneration. And then more recently, over the last 30 years, we've had uh, oftentimes increases in timber harvesting. And as the picture illustrates, this is an ash tree that was cut down. Uh, many of our eastern states, northeastern states, are subject to the pressures of emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, or other pests that are causing mortality. Whether or not we cut the trees, we're creating openings that are uh, providing opportunities for the forest to regenerate. So are we getting the regeneration that we need? So let's think then about what is forest regeneration. So that regeneration can be considered in from two different attributes. One is the composition of the forest of the regeneration. So that's the mix of species, what is present. And then we can also think about the strict the structure, which is how many stems are there, what's the average diameter of the stems, uh, what's the age, the variety of ages of those stems. So let's look at each of these individually. So with composition, uh, composition depends on seed source and some of the harvesting practices, and we'll talk about these a little bit later, that uh, remove just the largest trees. The largest trees are often of a particular species, and when those are eliminated, their ability to produce seed obviously is minimized. Uh, there can be selective pressures, and these aren't necessarily bad or good. It might be a low spot that, that collects water and is seasonally flooded, or might be a seasonal uh, cold area that, that's a frost pocket, or a thin soil, so there are selective pressures that favor some species over other species, and that would carry into soil aspects, soil conditions, and aspect, and also historic and recent land uses. So if it's been, uh, if there's been recent harvesting and there's scarification of the leaf litter or other kinds of practices that have done certain things to the soils or the site conditions, those can all influence the species that are present. In terms of structure, uh, we can think about not only needing to have desired species, but having those desired species in sufficient numbers that they fully occupy the growing space. Uh, and we can, and when we when we look at our woods or we look at the woods that we're managing, it's, I think it's insufficient to say I have regeneration, knowing that when you walk out into the woods, you see a desirable stem here and then a desirable stem over there. Rather, there are threshold numbers of stems that are necessary in order to populate the forest into the future. And I'm looking, this, this slide has a kind of a left side and a right side. On the right hand side, we can think about northern hardwoods, beech, birch, maple, and research that's been done is looking at the seedling level, so stems smaller than one inch in diameter. You need 10 to 20,000 seedlings per acre, depending upon if you're pre or post harvest, in order to in ensure that you're going to have enough stems to occupy the site and provide the growing conditions to develop uh, well-formed stems. The sapling size classes, you need fewer of those because you've already lost many of those smaller stems to natural mortality. On the left-hand side, I'm showing a stocking chart for upland hardwoods. This is work that was done by the Forest Service and Gingrich uh, many decades ago. And what I'm trying to illustrate with those green vertical bars that bump up against the diagonal line. If you look at the top end of that diagonal line, you see it's a three, so that's an average stem diameter of three inches. If you want to be fully stocked, you follow that rightmost green bar down and it says that you need 1,400 stems per acre on average that are three inches. 
on the lower end, you still need 800 stems per acre. So between uh, 800 and 1400 stems per acre. So that's not hugely different from what we're looking at with the northern hardwoods. So structure, the number of stems per acre matters when we want to have um, a full and successful regeneration. So composition matters and structure matters. Some of you are those saying, we talked about, um, or other people might be saying, um, I'm not worried about regeneration. You talk about harvesting and the harvesting that creates openings. Uh, and so if I'm not going to harvest, but I say there are lots of other things that create openings in the canopy, either small scale openings like wind or large scale openings such as uh, uh, combined stressors such as uh, and caterpillar defoliations or other insect defoliations followed by drought or episodic events uh, such as ice storms or emerald ash borer or hemlock woolly indulgent. So there are lots of things aside from what we might do deliberately that create conditions that favor uh, regeneration or what should favor regeneration in our forests. These forests are mature, things are happening as trees get older, the probability that something happens to them that causes them to die is increasingly likely. So the point of all of this is that our northeastern forests are mature. They're beautiful, they're productive, they're very valuable from, a, from many different perspectives, but they're mature in their they're continuing in their process of change. Part of that change is going to be canopy disturbances, and these might be small canopy disturbances or large, but whatever that canopy disturbance is, it reallocates sunlight from the canopy lower into the forest, either to a shrub layer or a subcanopy layer, or all the way to the forest floor. And it's in that understory where there will be either desirable or undesirable plants that grow. Um, the next forest depends upon what survives in the understory. So those species that occupy the understory and dominate the understory are most likely going to be the species that will be the next forest when the current canopy is gone. We've talked about our current mature forests and what they have to offer. Um, and we've, we've mentioned, I hinted at the fact earlier, maybe it wasn't quite such a hint, it was pretty blunt, that there's not good evidence that we're being successful in our regeneration. The Nature Conservancy study documented about 43% of the area that was good or very good uh, by their regeneration index. And our work looked had, we had a slightly more um, a conservative uh, description of success, and so we ended up with 30% that was highly or moderately successful. So both of these together are indicative of the fact that there are problems. So if there are problems, then the next step is to say what's causing those problems. We asked the question of the foresters who responded to the survey what they thought, uh, what, what factors, what variables were in play that were causing problems. And the winner across the state was the impacts of deer browsing. Uh, statewide, the average was 65% of the stands that should have regenerated and did not regenerate or where there was marginal success were impacted by deer. Less so in the Adirondacks, although no, not absent. Uh, the southern tier area of New York was about two thirds and, and in the lower Hudson area, which is the other, uh, about 90% of those had deer problems. The second most uh, common issue was interfering vegetation. That was relatively uniform across the state. So there were about half of the occasions where there were interfering plants causing problems. Uh, and this is not, uh, this is consistent with field research that's been done throughout the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast and the Lake States that has consistently identified deer and interfering vegetation as two, two problem uh, variables. So let's look first at the impact of deer. Uh, you've all seen this if you've been out in the woods. You can find seedlings, whether they're small seedlings as you see in the very small seedlings, that's about a, a 16 inch sugar maple seedling in the far left or a three to four foot sugar maple on the far right. 
or a red oak stump sprout that you see in the bottom center. So deer come along, they remove the growing tips of the plants. Uh, hardwoods have the ability to sprout for some period of time and then they continue to create these then bushy bonsai plants. And what's happening is that deer have not a lot to do during the day other than eat and they need about seven pounds of fresh weight per day. And that fresh weight, whether it's, uh, whether it's tree seedlings or alfalfa or hostas in your back garden, um, deer need to eat something. So if they're, if they're restricting their diet to woody plants, so this is the assumption with these numbers that I'm sharing, they're restricting their diet to woody plants, they will uh, consume about, uh, they're, they're in those seven pounds, there are 600 seedling tips per pound, so up to 4,200 seedling tips per deer per day. So as, as you've seen the deer in your woods, uh, there's not just one deer, there are often dozens of deer. And so if all they're doing is eating seedling tips, they can very quickly have a very profound impact on the plants. So they can influence the species composition and they can influence the structure. So this is kind of general and, and I don't know if it's theoretical or hypothetical, but we've started collecting data on seedlings around New York. This is using a protocol that's known as AVID or assessing the vegetation impacts of deer. This is a citizen science uh, program where we work with woodland owners and uh, land managers to tag and monitor height growth of seedlings. So this is one particular location in St. Lawrence County. This is data that uh, Mike Ashdown, a colleague, collected over a three-year time span. And the blue bar is um, hop hornbeam, Australia, and it's growing without any protection. And you can see in 2016, it was about 16 inches tall, and then it grew about four inches a year uh, for the next two years. The orange bar is sugar maple without a fence. And you can see in 2016, it was a little over seven inches and it pretty much stayed at a little over seven inches. And then the gray bar is sugar maple fenced, started out at about the same height in 2016 when that fence was established and then was growing three to four inches per year. So I've added some lines in to try to illustrate that. And you can see that uh, hop hornbeam, which is not a preferred browse species, has a similar growth trajectory as does the protected sugar maple seedlings, which is a preferred browse species, and the unprotected sugar maple flatlines, so essentially is not growing in height and continually gets nibbled back. So this is, and this pattern is consistent where we've put in these plots, and this is not a surprise to any of you. So the deer eat the palate, just deer not different from us, right? We like to eat the things that are enjoyable, and we tend not to eat the things that are not enjoyable. What this looks like over a few years is illustrated by this deer exclosure from the Adirondack League Club. So this is Western Adirondacks. This was a in a research uh, trial that I was working on with Paul Curtis. Paul was looking and Mike Ashdown were looking at vegetation response to deer. I was looking at herbicide treatments of American beach. So this was a plot where we had removed the beach. As you can see, it was mostly all beach. And the result was uh, inside the fence, that's the, the vegetation that you see in the center, it regrew yellow birch. Um, and this was a maybe a 10 foot by 10 foot fence. A uh, very strong response. This was about uh, five years after establishment. Where there was not a fence, it regrew ferns. So the deer were having a very significant problem. Uh, and yet deer were at a very low density. So in there's, there are some areas of the east where there will be 40 or 60 or 100 deer per square mile. This has eight deer per square mile. So it's very low deer density, very little agriculture, essentially no agriculture in this part of the Western Adirondacks. So even at a low deer density, it's not the number, the absolute number of deer so that's not a metric we need to think about. We need to think about the relative abundance, the relative density of deer.
That's what's important. What's also important when people say, well, hunters, and we'll talk about hunters here in a minute, eight deer per square mile is below the average threshold that most hunters are willing to endure. Most hunters are willing to endure, I forget the exact number, but somewhere in the 18 to 22 deer per square mile in order to keep hunters interested. So you can deer hunt when, where there's eight deer per square mile, but you spend a lot more time seeing trees than you do seeing deer. So, um, I was at a, a meeting with some foresters and I was talking about, you know, deer and all this, a similar presentation to this. And I had some foresters say, hey, I've got areas where I have good regeneration. So this is Tom Gilman. And I went out with Tom at, at his invitation and we looked at some sites around Tupper Lake, which is central Adirondacks that had been harvested uh, about 15 years prior to this picture. And this is an area that was, uh, these, were, these were large patch cuts of about 20 acres that were done with the mechanized uh, logging crew. So everything was harvested and there was a patchwork of these harvested and unharvested areas. There was, there was compliance with the Adirondack Park Agency uh, clear cutting regulations. So in these areas where you have significant acreages that are put into a regeneration phase all at the same time, and you have relatively speaking low numbers of deer, it's possible um, to overwhelm the deer population. And it's also possible that there's just too few deer to, um, because of winter conditions, the deer populations are held in check. So through, and I've just given, so it might be that, so there are minimal deer impacts in this case, it may have been because of the population was overwhelmed, maybe there was something else going on, it's hard to say, but it's not, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that everywhere you're going to find failures, but failures do occur. I mentioned hunters earlier, and there's a lot of effort on the part of, of um, people, and I'm a hunt, I like to deer hunt. Um, people say, well, we don't need to think about, we need to worry about other strategies for managing deer because we have deer hunters. And this concept of recreational deer hunting as a strategy to control the impacts of deer. And I'll make the argument, and you can, um, there, and, and there are cases where this doesn't follow, doesn't play out, uh, but there are relatively too few hunters, and the number of hunters is declining, and it's a statistic that I show at the bottom from Michigan, where there's a 21% decline in the number of hunters over the last 20 years. The hunters that we do have tend to be aging. These are some friends of mine who are hunting at the Arnott Forest, looks like from the, the time stamp back in 2003. Uh, they're all very good hunters, but they're all uh, 15 years older now than they were then, and they don't climb the hills as fast and, and push through the brush as aggressively as they used to. And they, we all spend, tend to spend less time in the woods. So the, the capacity for recreational hunting to limit the number of deer is questionable. Is it an important part of the solution? It certainly is, but in and of itself, it's insufficient. And that's because the capacity for deer to reproduce is greater than our typical capacity to limit the population growth. So this is a illustration from the Guide to Urban Bow Hunting. This was a slide I got from uh, Paul Curtis and Gary Goff a few years ago. And it says if we start off in year one with a deer population of two deer, a buck and a doe, and they reproduce, um, and things are going well, so there's a lot of assumptions here, right? They have adequate food supply, uh, nothing is limiting, uh, there are no mortality factors in play, they're gonna double, so two deer become four deer, four deer become six deer, and you can see that change. Over a seven year time span, we jump from two deer, a population size of two, to a population size of 40. And on average, there's about a 50% growth per year. So if, if, that, if that's a growth of 50% on average per year, then in order to stabilize the deer herd, about 50% of that herd must die every year 
or go someplace else. Well, they're not going to go someplace else and they need to buy. So if you're old age or you hit them in your new car or hunters or predators or something. So if you get to that 50% mortality threshold, you haven't solved the problem. If you start with a problem and you get to 50% mortality, you haven't solved the problem. You've merely stabilized the problem. So you still have the same number of deer. It just isn't getting any bigger. So, so deer are a problem. And what deer do, as I've illustrated with the picture from St. Lawrence County, is they preferentially browse some species and do not browse other species. So there's this dual disordered um, cascading effect of deer where they preferentially browse almost always the species that we want uh, and leave behind the species that we don't want. So this, they create problems of interfering vegetation even when you remove the deer in some cases if not most cases you leave behind or is left behind interfering vegetation and that's known as what's known as the legacy effect if i use the term uh, interfering in place of the term invasive plants um, so let me just give a little perspective on invasive plants uh, it's defined, at least in New York, to have two important attributes. One is that it's a plant that interferes with human or societal objective, objectives, so it causes some problem. And then secondly, an invasive plant is one that's non-native, so an invasive species is one that's not historically known uh, from the New York landscape. Context, though, as I see this, is we have a lot of exotics or non-natives that are not invasive. So corn is not considered an invasive species even though it's not native. Apple trees are not considered invasive even though they are not native. And in fact, with those two examples, there are some very beneficial non-native species. On top of that, we have native species that act like invasive species. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, if you don't know them, we'll talk about them in just a minute. So because of that, I'm less concerned about whether they are native or non-native, but rather whether they're interfering, if we have plants that are interfering with our ability to manage and utilize and enjoy our forests. So with interfering vegetation, after the deer, um, after the harvesting, uh, we still may have plant problems. So this is known as the legacy effect, and it's been documented by several different research studies. So what are these plants? Uh, let's start by looking at some of the uh, native plants. This was the 2008 uh, report on uh, New York forests. And what I'm illustrating here are the numbers of saplings. So the saplings are defined as stems that are at least one inch, but less than five inches in DBH, which is diameter of breast height. So one to five inch stems and the change in numbers in New York between 1993 and 2008. So the 93 data are blue, the 2008 data are red. So where we have the red bar is longer than the blue bar, that means we have increased recruitment into the sapling size class. So these are, these are stems that have survived the seedling stage up to an inch and have gotten uh, big enough to grow into this sapling size class. There are four species where there's an increase between 93 and 2008. The yellow birch, the top you see has a very small increment. The spruces also have a small increment. Uh, balsam fir has a small increment. And most significantly is American beech, which had uh, about, I, so I calculated, I didn't have the numbers, I was doing it from the the graph about a 25 to 30 percent increase in the number of stems in the sapling size class between 1993 and 2008. Uh, in the report from the Nature Conservancy 2010 report, uh, they also found from the forest inventory and analysis data, which was what this graph was based on, that beech is the most abundant regeneration species. So, how can we manage it? What do we, what do we need to do when we think about? controlling interfering plants as well as controlling deer. 
there was an intern that worked on a project at the Arnott Forest about 15 years ago, Karen Camperin with Paul Curtis and Gary Goff, and they used a series of 10 by 10 foot plots. So these are relatively small, so it's not an operational size effort, and they had four treatments. So there were two factors, cut or no cut, and fence or no fence. So in these, roughly the the, the, the treatment area is bigger than 10 foot by 10 foot, but in these relatively small areas, it was assigned either cut, no cut, or fence, no fence. So the control had no fencing and no cutting. And then treatment B had only cutting, treatment C had only fencing, treatment D had both cut and fence. And what this slide illustrates is the number of stems that were greater than 26 centimeters, so about 10 inches tall, and um, this would have been about three years after the treatments were installed. You see the control, if you do nothing, you get some amount of desirable, but a greater number of greater density of undesirable stems. If all you do is cut, especially in these small areas, you concentrate deer activity and the deer browse back everything. If all you do is fence, you exclude deer, you're able to regrow uh, a, a higher, about four times the density of desirable tree species versus undesirable tree species. So the undesirables would have been striped maple and American beech and maybe some hop hornbeam. If you cut and fence, you get a significantly greater regeneration response from desirable relative to undesirable. Both of them are uh, enhanced by the reduction in competition and the elimination of deer browsing. So this gave us, you know, as we were thinking about uh, what we can do in managing our forest, we're thinking about, well, we not only need to control the interfering plants, but we also need to, and importantly, control the access that deer have to this regeneration layer. And I should say that in 2003, this was five years after we had started what we called the Ernebuck program at the Arnott Forest, because the Arnott is a Cornell property, which is a private landowner. We were able to uh, restrict hunters to being eligible to shoot a buck only after they had shot two does. That started in 1998, I guess 98 was our first year of the project, we implemented the, the protocol in 99. And in those first few years, we had uh, very high levels of harvest of deer. We probably doubled the number of harvest of deer. And, and in 2003, in, in the areas that were unfenced, you can see that those were still uh, heavily impacted by the presence of deer. So we've talked about deer, we've talked about interfering plants. The other the other factor that comes into play here when we think about the composition and the structure of forest regeneration is how we're harvesting our forests. So let's look at har some harvesting practices. Unfortunately, one of the more common practices is what's known as selective harvesting, and the, the emphasis there is on the IVE. So selective harvesting is a phrase or a term that's associated with um, exploitive or non-sustainable, where you select uh, usually the best trees by some, uh, some attribute, either by diameter or by uh, stem quality, and you remove only the best trees. Now, this is different from maybe at one point going in and, and low grading or cutting the lower value trees, and then subsequently uh, in the near future event, harvesting higher value trees, those two harvesting episodes are, can work in concert to create favorable conditions. The problem with selective harvesting, it's, it, it's either applied, as I said, on a diameter limit, so all trees larger than a certain size or all trees that have better than a certain quality of stem are removed. The problem is that most of our forests are even aged. So you remember to an earlier slide where we had lots of agriculture in the 1800s and regeneration of that uh, abandoned agricultural land, those forests are even aged. This is an, an example of a forest that's even aged. The trees are marked for a game of logging activity and it, it actually looks like 
it's favoring the harvest of some of the bigger trees. I, I did the marking and they were, the, what you can't see is the quality of the crowns. And you see a tree on the far right that's in blue. That's a hedgerow tree. That's a, a red oak hedgerow tree that is, um, has seeded in. This is mostly sugar maple. So even though the, the illustration I'm trying to make with this slide is not the marking prescription, but rather the variety of sizes of trees that are all the same age. With, with that similarity of age, but differential in size, we can develop crown classes. So we have some trees are taller than their neighbors, even though they're the same age as their neighbors. And we can think about upper crown class trees and lower crown class trees. So the upper crown class trees in this slide are blue. We have dominance and co-dominant trees in those those crown class uh, attributes are based on the height of a tree relative to its neighbors within an age class. So you might, if you have a, a patch or an opening where you have truly younger forest, then you're not comparing those trees to neighboring trees. So this is within an age class. The upper crown class trees have a greater capacity to respond to an increase of sunlight. They're more responsive than are the lower crown class trees, which tend to be non-responsive or much less responsive. And Dr. Nyland did work that showed that those upper crown class trees can grow three to times, three to eight times faster than the lower crown class trees when they're given an increase in sunlight. And that's not surprising, right? Because the, the crown, if you just look at the colored um, objects and you think of that as leaf area, the, the blue have considerably more leaf area, the blue trees than do the red trees. And so if leaf area is the photoreceptor for sunlight, which it is, and it's that sunlight that makes trees grow faster, the blue trees, the upper crown class trees, are gonna have a greater uh, photosynthetic area to capture the sunlight and to respond more aggressively. The issue is that all of these trees would be of the same age. So cutting the bigger trees means that you're not cutting the older trees, you're just simply cutting the trees that have grown the best and you're removing the winners uh, from the pool. This is uh, illustrated in, a, in an example from, uh, this was from Brett Chedzoy's woodlot. He had, was doing some harvesting and about the same time he had had it harvested, he had a tornado go through and so he had some unanticipated harvesting. And what I'm illustrating, as you can see with the yellow arrow, arrow, a cookie of a sugar maple tree that's resting on a red oak tree. And we aged those by counting the growth rings and they were both the same age. And even though I'm uh, you know, comfortable looking at a forest and saying, yes, this is even aged, I would not have anticipated that those two were the same age but we both aged them, we both came up with the same numbers. They were both about 90 years old. So there's a four inch maple, roughly four inch, and roughly 25 inch red oak that were exactly the same age. And this is not too um, uh, unrealistic to believe if we think about trees as biological organisms, and then we compare that to other groups of biological organisms, such as a classroom of sixth graders. If you go into a sixth grade classroom, all of those kids are going to have be of different sizes, you know, tall, short, skinny, whatever, but they're all the same age other than Ernie that's been there for a couple of years. And I, hopefully there's nobody named Ernie here, but anyway, there's some kid that's, you know, that's, that's been around for a couple of years in sixth grade, but everybody else is exactly the same age. They're sixth graders. And, uh, but they're growing at different rates. And, and it's, that's a reflection of biological populations that some organisms, some individuals grow faster than other individuals. And in that sixth grade classroom, they're all the same species. So when we go into a forest, and we have four or seven or 10 different species, we would, we would think and presume that those species are gonna have different growth rates. So if we go in and we're harvesting just the biggest trees, we would have cut the red oak uh, and left behind the sugar maple thinking, oh, it's, it's a juvenile stem and we're going to let that tree go, let that tree grow. Uh, and that's not what happens. That tree has failed on that particular site and it's not going to be responding well. Dr. Nyland did work 
through the Society of American Foresters several years ago in uh, what was known as the Timber Harvesting Assessment Project and identified a number of unsustainable harvesting practices. Uh, and you can see, you can read the list uh, for yourself. Uh, in the residual stand following unsustainable practices, there are a number of features that characterize what that stand is going to look like. So these, these practices don't lend themselves don't lend themselves to uh, sustainability, nor do they lend themselves to regeneration. So we're removing potentially entire species groups and we're facilitating the development of interfering vegetation in the understory. So the point then is that we are developing understories beneath these mature forest canopies, either through natural processes, uh, just natural growth, or through canopy disturbances, whether they're large scale or small scale disturbances. Deer browsing favors the growth of, I say undesirable species. They're species that typically have no commercial value and are as a group uh, less diverse than the species that are being uh, eliminated. And subsequently, the cascading effect is that those undesirable species interfere with and inhibit the growth and development of desirable species. How do we grow a new forest? Well, one strategy is that I'm going to be very brief on is artificial regeneration. Um, everybody likes to plant trees. It's a feel-good kind of thing, and we've probably all done it at some point in time or another. Um, it usually doesn't happen in any great um, extent, aerial extent, uh, as part of the regeneration and regrowth of eastern forests. And there are uh, three key attributes in terms of preparation for tree planting. Uh, first and foremost is that you have to match the tree species to the soils. So if you have a poorly drained soil, then you need to have tree species that are adapted to growing on poorly drained soils. Secondly, you need to, or whatever your soils are. Secondly, you need to prepare in advance, uh, which includes removing competing vegetation. In this case, this was a, a tree tube study that I started. We did a pre-treatment with glyphosate, a ban treatment to kill the vegetation in the planting zone, and we mowed between the rows uh, to keep the vegetation out. So you do that in advance, and then you also need to have whatever you're going to use as a strategy to protect your trees. Make sure you have those. So if you plant your trees and say, I'm going to come back in three weeks and protect them in some parts of the state, if one of those, um, you would have had significant damage to the planting stock. Ideally, you plant in the spring so that you can allow the root systems to develop over the summer and you immediately protect those trees from deer. And then you have to make a commitment to controlling competing vegetation for several years because you're not fully occupying the site. So without occupying the site, other plants are gonna grow and they would overtake and overwhelm those trees. Uh, in terms of individual tree protection, there are a couple of options. You see on the left a metal cage, so that's a four foot high fence. So that's, I call it welded wire. It's a two inch by four inch mesh, and you cut off a section that's big enough to enclose the plant. Uh, this particular plant was a black cherry that had become established. It was coppiced, protected with this cage and uh, two years later was over six feet tall. So it, it had an established root system. Black cherry, as many of the hardwoods sprout well when you cut them back about an inch or two above ground, and then they grow very well. On the right, and those, tr those cages are about a little over $3 a piece. I say plus, and there's plus the maintenance cost of those because you need to go in and make sure that they're secure every year, make sure they haven't blown over, make sure bears or animals haven't tipped them over. On the right, you see just a variety of different um, um, plastic tree tubes that have been used. Those are slightly more expensive. They create can create a bit of a greenhouse effect. Um, if you have holes in them, that's important because that allows for an equalization of interior and exterior temperatures. Without those holes, then you get a enhancement early in the spring and late in the fall for growth, and you predispose your seedlings to either 
late spring frosts or early fall frosts. The advantage of the tubes is that if you're going to be using herbicides to control competing vegetation, the tube offers protection against the seedling that the cage does not. So again, this is not uh, something that's done very broadly, and each of these, this is a, this is a labor-intensive effort. You don't see this over, certainly not hundreds of acres, typically not, I don't see it over tens of acres. Where I see this applied is more on the scale of dozens or scores of trees in a particular area, maybe a hundred or more. Then we have natural regeneration. Um, and here what we're trying to do with natural regeneration is use the species that are present on site and we're going to control the, the species that are present. That's the seed source, that's the composition, and then the quantity of light. So we're determining which stems get sunlight. And there are two broad categories with natural regeneration. There's uneven age systems and even age systems. So let's look first at uneven aged. And this is a kind of a cartoon that illustrates the two typical types of uneven aged regeneration systems. There's a single tree on the left where you cut a single mature stem that creates a small opening and you're able to, in theory, regenerate the species within that small gap. And, and you can do this. Uh, if you go, if you cut more than one large tree, you can create a group and uh, you, you add more sunlight into that regeneration area. By that added sunlight, I'm illustrating with the added colors, you get a greater potential for a greater diversity of tree species. Um, and I see there are questions coming in. Uh, please go ahead and keep typing those in. I'm not going to talk about those um, just because I've only got uh, a few minutes left. Wow. Um, but we'll, we'll look at those at the end. All right. Here's an illustration of a group selection in Genesee County. So this is up kind of west of Rochester. And it was a, a group that was attempting to regenerate some black cherry. And there was black cherry that was established in this understory layer. Um, I haven't been back to see whether that survived. And then this is an illustration uh, that Greg Sarges from the Nature Conservancy provided a patch cut in the Western Adirondacks. So uneven age systems are useful uh, where you're trying to attain specific objectives. And that is typically a continuous high force. So you never lose the high canopy, although you create pockmarks in it as either single tree or gap selections. It's going to favor tolerant, shade tolerant and mid tolerant species just because there's not a lot of sunlight. It's also going to favor in New York and much of the East, favor species that are not only tolerant of shade but also uh, non-palatable as browse species. So the concerns then are, uh, and I've, uh, for those of you who've studied silviculture, you know I've done a very shallow analysis and description of uneven age systems. There are repeated entries and there's risks for damage to, to residual stems with frequent repeated entries. Um, you're going to shift to shade tolerant species that might be desirable or not desirable. You're creating these small openings, which we've seen in some of our work are magnets for deer and deer browsing. Uh, because of that deer browsing and low sunlight, there is typically a loss of species diversity, and it's a much more complex system to apply. Even age systems, in contrast, grow forests at uh, stands, rather, all the same age. So the uneven age systems have a stand or a management unit where you have multiple ages. Even age stands have essentially all eight all of the trees are of the same age. And there's four different ways that you can apply this, as you see uh, enumerated on the slide. Sometimes these work and sometimes they don't. This was a strip clear cut we did at the Arnott Forest. The cutting was done in May of 2005. It was 100 feet wide. It was primarily um, a beech, red maple, red oak stand on a west slope, fairly thin, dry soils. Uh, the plan was to try to regenerate uh, red oak, uh, 
by uh, seed drops. So we left some occasional residual red oak inside the strip and along the uh, edges of the strip. 10 years after that, we had done a really good job of regrowing American beech and striped maple and a little bit of aspen. And another five years beyond that, we're now at essentially 100% pin cherry, aspen, and American beech. So it was not successful in regenerating what we were trying to do. So it was this and some other um, efforts at regeneration at the Arnott in the early 2000s that we that made us pause and say we want to make sure that we're doing this sustainably and so for about 15 years we stopped regeneration harvests. Uh, here are some examples of seed tree harvest on the left and shelterwood harvest on the right. The big difference is that you know clear cuts you take all of the trees seed trees you leave a few residual trees per acre 10 to 15 trees per acre as a seed source the shelter would you leave a seed source but also more shading so you have greater um, control over and and reduced uh, intensities of changes in local environmental conditions why would you want to use an even age system? Maybe that you have tree or wildlife species that require full sunlight. You're perhaps trying to create a large contiguous homogeneous habitat conditions. And maybe that you have a low productivity site and it just because it's not growing very much you can't uh, justify the frequency of entries. Uh, even age systems are relatively simple to apply and uh, there would in theory be reduced damage to the residual because of fewer entries. So how do we then, given even age and uneven age systems, how do we successfully regenerate? Well, we need to do three things. We need to make sure that we have a seed source. We need to illuminate the plants that we want to grow, and we want to protect the plants that we're trying to grow from deer browsing. So the two key issues that we have seen um, at the Arnott Forest that I've seen and heard in talking to foresters throughout New York and that have shown up uh, throughout decades of scientific research are deer impacts and interfering vegetation. So let's look at these. Fencing is an option to control deer. I'm going to focus on, let me back up here, I'm going to focus primarily on deer um, and less so on interfering vegetation. Uh, so fencing, we have some options that are relatively inexpensive, a little over slightly more than 50 cents a foot installed, uh, but they're only effective on small patches. So this would be, we're thinking quarter, tenth of an acre to quarter acre. We designed them for woodlot owners that have relatively small acreages that might be thinking about regenerating or maple producers, they're not looking to do large scale harvesting. So these would be patch openings. On the left, you see eight strand high tensile that could be electrified if you had an option. And on the right, you see a single strand of high tensile with mesh that's five feet tall. And what we found, uh, and these were four different cooperators that we had around the state of New York, St. Lawrence and Essex County in the north. Green County south of Albany towards the lower Hudson area and then Yates County in the Finger Lakes. The cross hatched is the mesh. So the far left for each location is mesh. The horizontal banding is high tensile and the gray bar is the control. So this was unfenced. And in all cases, the mesh outperformed the high tensile and typically both of them outperformed the controls. And on average, we found that deer browsing, so the absence of fencing, uh, reduces the average height increment, the annual growth increment, two to seven fold uh, relative to fenced areas. So the deer are having an, an impact um, throughout the state and that's a measurable significant reduction in growth. Uh, as I said, the mesh tends to be better, more effective at, at excluding deer and favoring the growth of trees that does high tensile. This is a relatively easy uh, system to set up. You do need some specialized tools. And when we've calculated it based on the time that we spend in construction and the materials, both of them cost about the same. The cost on the high tensile is for time. 
because you need to run eight strands around and then the cost for the mesh is in the materials. It's a fairly quick to set up. For larger areas, you can use a high fence option. The, the strategy is the same. You have a batten block that you attach to low value trees. You see those illustrated on the left. It's a rock resistant piece of wood that's attached with a fender washer and a rust resistant nail. So as the tree grows, it pushes against the block, which pushes against the fender washer, which floats the nail. And then the fence is attached to that block. Um, this is a mesh fence, as you see on the right. It's a two inch square mesh. Uh, this particular fence is going up around a harvest we did in the sugar bush at the Arnot. Eight foot of fence uh, with a foot of apron. So the top of the fence is about six and a half to seven and a half feet above ground. There's a high tensile wire near the top and another one near the bottom uh, so that it keeps deer from going underneath it. We also, as you see in the picture on the right, would, would uh, load up the apron to keep deer from going underneath. So some of the BMPs, the best practices for installing any of these fences, particularly the mesh though, is that you wanna mark your post trees before you do the harvest because those would typically be the trees that would, you would cut. Uh, use two wires, especially with the high, high fence, the eight foot fence. You wanna have an apron at the bottom that you anchor with debris Ideally, you'll put in an external hot wire so you have both a physical barrier and a psychological barrier and you plan ahead for maintenance. So you have to walk this fence once a week or once every other week. If a tree falls on it, deer will very quickly figure that out. They'll get inside and then you have to deal with trying to get in the deer out. This particular fence we estimated the cost at something over three and a half dollars a foot. So if we had, if we had hired somebody at $25 an hour, this was a, this was 350 a foot. My guess is commercial operations would be four and a half to five dollars a foot. Brush piles can be effective. Um, they do restrict access of deer to seedlings, as you see in the picture. I think that they're going to be most effective where you have established seedlings because brush piles tend to be fairly small. They break down fairly quickly. So if you're waiting for seed set, to, in the seed rain to go into the slash pile and the seedlings grow. The seedlings, uh, depending upon the amount of sunlight, you're getting three to five inches of height growth that we've monitored uh, per year. So if you're gonna get above five feet, you're looking at a long time before you get above the height of deer. And it also does not ensure full stocking. So where we've gotten is slash walls. And this is where we've worked with, we've, we have completed four different harvests. Uh, we did uh, with slash walls, they range in size from nine acres to 74 acres. And we required the contractors to pile slash at the perimeter, a minimum of 10 feet high and 10 feet wide, such that it is uh, sufficiently dense to exclude deer. We've had no evidence of deer going over the top on the, on the largest slash wall, the 74 acre slash wall, there have been a couple of places where deer have gone through or underneath where there was bridging of a large tree trunk or tree stem across other tree stems. So at most in the 74 acre harvest at any one time, we've had a doe and a fawn, and those have been, I'll say, short lived on the inside. This is the largest harvest completed and enclosed to date. This is 74 acres and you can see the pattern of the slash wall around the perimeter as well as the primary skid trails. What seems to work the best is mechanized direction, directional felling. So the, the logging contractor cuts the trees. We typically limit the number of seed trees near the perimeter so that the the contractor can have ease of movement. The slash is not transported across the harvest site. It's, it is uh, cut the, the crown of the tree for merchantable stems. The crown is placed on the perimeter and then the hot saw snips off the merchantable portion and then a grapple skitter removes that merchantable portion. We also contract with the loggers to uh, mow the interfering vegetation and that ends up costing about $100 an acre. So we're both controlling the interfering vegetation and limiting the access to deer. So I mentioned the specifications uh, in the contract were 10 feet by 10 feet. 
on average, when we've measured them, they've been 10 feet high and 23 feet wide. So much wider base in order to get to that 10 foot height. We've completed 16,000 feet on four different harvests and we have two additional harvests uh, in progress. What this looks like, and these are the four different harvests that were done in 2007. We had the operator keep track of time. And when you just look at machine hours, at $200 per hour for operator and machine, you can see the cost per foot. The average there is $1.47, we'll call it $1.50 per foot for machine hours. So that's very low if you're just looking at the cost of installation. Obviously there's some cost of material, so there's, there's a forfeiture of slash that remains on site as part of the wall. So in the harvesting that we have going on now in 2019, we've been doing an inventory and we do this in 100 foot sections as the wall is being constructed, estimating the diameters of stems. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, you see the overall average per 100 foot section of wall is 31 tons per 100 feet. So that's 0.3 tons per foot. If we just consider material that's six inches and larger, so that would be what we can sell, uh, we're looking at about 20 tons. So when you calculate that as our lost value, that works out to about 75 cents a foot. If you add that 75 cents to the prior estimate of time of $1.50, we're looking at $2.25 a foot. It's actually less than that because the uh, 2017 harvest averaged two feet per minute. The contractor has moved along the learning curve and is now producing about two and a half feet per minute. So it's something less than $2.25 a foot. And other than plugging an occasional hole, there's essentially no cost for uh, maintenance. So if a tree falls on the slash wall, the slash wall gets better. Okay, so there's Brett and I, and I'm going to stop sharing. What's our time look like? So we're a little past one o'clock. My apologies for that. And I will take questions. So thank you all. Uh, and while I have your attention, I guess I've had your attention, um, for those of you interested in continuing education credits, those uh, were taken care of when you registered for the webinar, and it assumes that you logged in. Um, if you're sitting with somebody else and your name doesn't show up on the screen, then it's not going to be easy for me to document your participation for continuing education credits. So I'm scrolling back and I see some uh, okay, our first comment, 1213, any thoughts about the impacts of climate change on the forest regeneration rates? So I have not looked at that myself. I've done a little bit of reading on studies that were published on climate change. Uh, there's a recent one that came out, just uh, kind of hit the press or hit the public sector a few weeks ago by Miller and McGill, and they were looking at uh, a number of stressors. And while they found that there was some association of slightly of a reduction, so they, they coined the term regeneration debt. And regeneration debt is characterized by one of two different factors, either an absence of desirable reproduction in the understory, or a mismatch in the species composition between the understory and the overstory. Uh, and what they found was that climate change was not the greatest influence on the regeneration debt, but rather it was deer, and they were looking at invasive species. They did not broaden it to interfering vegetation, uh, broadly, so native and non-native. So they looked at non-native species and or deer were the two biggest factors. Okay, Marguerite says, I'm surprised that such a low deer population, eight deer per square mile, would cause a dramatic impact on regeneration. What's the threshold for deer numbers to cause an impact like what you saw with yellow birch? So the other fact, other thoughts on factors that were at play. So 
um, the facts of the history of that site, that was a, that's a private club. It's 50,000 acres in the Western Adirondacks. Back in the, and I'm kind of guessing at these numbers in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they fed deer. So they had an unusually high uh, population of deer because of feeding. They stopped at some point, stopped feeding the deer. And so they were maintaining this relatively large uh, level of deer population. Uh, and, it, and it annihilated the understory in the forest. So they were not, not only not growing sugar maple, they were not growing even American beech. So that's why what, what we illustrated there was, Amer was fern um, levels. And those, keep in mind that that was a relatively small opening in other areas where they'd done commercial harvest, they were growing American beech as well as fern. Uh, that's also uh, a, a part of the state or region of the state where there's relatively poor soil fertility and um, uh, the lack of soil calcium may have played into that. So as I said earlier, when I talk about deer and interfering plants, those are broad regional uh, barriers to regeneration. There are other localized problems such as perhaps soil fertility. All right. Uh, if commercial harvesting for timber is not an objective, could hopworm be considered desirable considering decreasing species diversity in regeneration? So hopworm beam is not a bad species. You know, none of these trees are quote unquote bad species. Uh, the desirability of them depends upon the objectives that we overlay on our, our, own, our own human objectives. The, the challenge with hop hornbeam and the, under, the interfering plants is that the deer favor them to the exclusion and, and they exclude other species. So even without harvesting, the presence of deer shifts the composition from diverse to non-diverse or to lower diversity. So the overstory might have six or eight or 10 species in the overstory. Uh, there may be one or two that are dominant, but there's a variety in the overstory. Because of the actions of deer, that number can be restricted to a much lower number. The other concern with species like hop hornbeam and pawpaw or spice bush or all of the invasive shrubs or uh, striped maple is that they're not canopy dominants. So if you had a natural disturbance event like an ice storm or a windstorm and you lost the canopy, you had a high canopy and it was lost and you had an understory that was dominated by hop hornbeam, that's going to be your next forest. So you lose the high canopy. Um, that has impacts on productivity, on carbon sequestration, on the wildlife species that might benefit from that. Okay, John says, have the antlerless deer hunting requirements continued in PA and have they resulted in any improvements in tree regeneration at the landscape level? I don't know the answer to that. So um, uh, hopefully there's somebody from Pennsylvania that can write a comment about deer hunting policy and the impacts of that. Joanne says, we've had success with a modified pallet tree protect protector in a challenging environment. I'll post a pic to Cornell, the Ning site. Great, great. Um, so the Ning site, for those of you that don't know, is cornellforestconnect.ning.com. It's a social media site, and you can post pictures and questions and read the blog and stuff like that. And wants to know if the Forest Stewardship Council FSC banned glyphosate. I'm not, I have not heard that, but there may be somebody that knows better than me. Alexander says, rough cost per foot for that high fence that utilizes low quality trees. Yep, so I showed the picture. So we, if you go to forestconnect.ning.com, I just posted our calculation of all of the costs, including the supply list and the number of hours to put in that perimeter on a 30 acre harvest. Uh, so that that was a f just over 4,000 feet of perimeter. Uh, we opted, that was in, in a harvest in the sugar bush, we opted to do a fence rather than a slash wall even though the fence was more expensive for two reasons. One, we didn't think we had maybe three reasons. One, we didn't think we had enough slash at the perimeter to make it easy to do a slash wall. 
and so that would have that would have increased the costs of that. A second factor was that the logger that we wanted to do the harvesting, so this was a sugar bush, but it was also an intensive research site. So we were really um, persnickety about the kinds of harvesting and to get a feller buncher in there, uh, we didn't feel like we would have as much control. So we wanted a ground crew, a single operator that we handpicked that was exceptionally good at felling trees. And he had, we had no damage on any of the research trees. So he didn't have the equipment to do the slash wall. Um, and third, it also gave us, um, it, it was in an area that we could easily access so we could do the checking that we needed to do the checking and it provides for us a teachable moment to show people, here's a plastic mesh fence and now let's go look at a slash wall. Um, Paul says slash wall seems like a practical solution, that's what we think. He's interested to see the results in the future, as are we. Susan wants to know how to get rid of lots and lots of hay-scented fern. Um, so two thoughts on that. First of all, uh, if, if, if I literally and strictly read the question, the best way to get rid of ferns is through a, a, a glyphosate uh, mixed with oust mist blower. Uh, that will kill the ferns. Typically though, where you have a fern problem, it's because you have a deer problem. So if you're not also controlling the deer, you can spray the ferns. You may get some hardwood seedlings to grow, but then those are just going to feed the deer. So you would want to concurrently address the deer problem. You can verify if in fact you do have a deer problem, but if, if you have that deer problem, then control the deer problem or anything that you do with the ferns is going to be a wasted effort. There's also been some research, and I haven't looked at it recently, in Massachusetts where the, when they excluded the deer, they were able to grow trees up through the ferns. So it wasn't, the ferns can be a problem, but the ferns are really a problem when you also have deer. Colin wants to know if it's gonna be archived. Yes, so all of these webinars are archived at youtube.com slash forest connect. So Susan wants to know the email addresses. I'll type those in. Mine is pjs23 cornell.edu and Brett's is bjc22 six at cornell.edu. All right, let me back up. Okay, David says, wants to know if there are these are all expensive solutions. Indeed they are. So the, the nice thing about um, the slash wall option is that you can leverage that work to be done against the process of harvesting. So unless you've inherited a woodlot that has been um, high graded and it has essentially no value in it, then you can use the value, some of the harvest value with the appropriate operator contractor to produce the slash wall. We're, we're hoping to do some research to evaluate slash walls on patch and group selection harvesting because uh, even though we did it on a nine acre harvest, to move in the equipment that's capable of doing that, a, a logging contractor is not gonna come to one property for one nine acre shelter wood harvest. Uh, they were already on site and they had done three or other harvests that totaled more than 100 acres. So if you have 30 acres, you're not going to harvest 30 acres all at once probably. So you need some other options. The small patch fencing option exists. And so if you do a search for Cornell low cost deer fence designs or something like that, you can get the fact sheet that has all those specifications. Those work, they're relatively inexpensive and you can do small group uh, regeneration. Um, and I'm not, you ask about voodoo, I'm not aware of any voodoo options, although maybe we'll look at that in the future. 
Um, Catherine wants to know if we have examples of slash piles using other materials such as construction debris. So somebody mentioned pallets, um, those, I guess, so essentially it's a physical barrier. So anything that you have that would work as a physical barrier. And I've heard of people doing um, what's called, oh, I've, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but essentially you cut all of the stems in the understory and you create an impenetrable jungle and mess. And that has been, I've not seen that in practice, but the people that have done it said that it has been effective. So I will, I'll reserve judgment on that. Um, but that's going to, depending upon what you have as an owner, as an objective, as an owner, if deer can't get in there, you can't get in there either. And so your ability to get in there and hunt or cut firewood or the aesthetics of that is going to be um, limited. Okay, thank you, Lee. So Nia wants to know if extending the rifle season would help reduce deer populations. My guess is the answer is not enough to make a difference. So New York has been experienced, has been experienced experimenting with focus areas where they have very long deer seasons and you can shoot essentially as many deer as you can. You can print off a new tag a day and so you can shoot a deer a day and I don't I just don't think that there's enough hunters that are good enough at what they do that have full access to the landscape. So the other part of the deer population is that if you're only hunting on property where you have legal access, which is the only place you should hunt, um, then there are refugia and the deer quickly learn where those refuge are. They go in and they hang out there. And that's why the day after deer season, you drive around and you see um, herds of 20 or 30 deer in, in agricultural fields is because they've, they've hidden and escaped the deer season. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you, Mariana. Is there a minimum acreage? Scott says in a clear cut setting allows regeneration to clear and succeed given the Adirondacks in Western New York are different playing fields. So Scott's up in Northern New York. So you can, any, essentially any size opening can be regenerated. So a single tree, and that's not technically a clear cut, but a single tree opening creates sunlight on the forest floor that you can regenerate. Um, the bigger the opening, the more sunlight, the more sunlight, the greater variety of tree species, the greater diversity of tree species and plants you'll be able to establish. And very large, then you create very different environmental conditions. And so, you know, what you're probably thinking about is from a tenth or a quarter acre opening up to five or 10 acres. And you can, you can flavor that with some scattered residual trees and what have you, but all of those create enough sunlight to regenerate. The question is if you have, um, uh, if it's too small, then it's a very focal air focused area for deer browsing. I don't know how big you would need to get in the Western Adirondacks and the Adirondack League Club. They were doing 100 adjacent, I'll say 100 acre clear cuts or seed tree harvests. And with that, they were able, that's where they had the eight deer per square mile. With that, they were having some success at regenerating the forests. So Alex is working in red pine plantations, wants to know if the thin tops would be enough to create a dense wall. Yes, they would be, you just need more of them. So one of the, we, the, one of the mid-size harvests, like the 13 acre harvest we did was a conversion of a senescing red pine plantation uh, to the residual hardwood stand. And uh, that, was, that was very effective. There's not a lot, I mean, there's not a lot of value in red pine to begin with. So if you leave the top half of the stem and you stack them together, uh, that can be very much impenetrable. And we have no evidence of any deer inside the, the red pine harvest area. Okay, Rick points out that um, uh, the distinction between native and non-native and invasive is important if only cognizant of the ethics of what we plant and where. Certainly, so we don't want to create uh, we don't want to create problems. It's easier to prevent a problem than to fix a problem. 
and indeed there are native and non-native plants that do not easily reestablish or uh, naturally regenerate. The invasive is that um, it's also causing a problem. And so the point I was making was that uh, we can, it, is that we can think a little bit more broadly than just native or non-native and what's the impact of that. And so I'm not advocating for causing problems. I'm sorry if that was perceived. Charlie has deer running into plastic fence and destroying it in New Jersey. And we have seen that in some places. That's um, part of the reason why we put a offset hot wire around the perimeter of our sugar bush fence. It'll be 30 inches off the ground and on a about a 12 inch pigtail that, that's also attached to those same trees. And then we bait it. So we get the deer to come in, they hit the bait on, it's a scented bait. So they hit that bait on a hot wire and get a psychological lesson of where they don't want to go. Now, if you have something that's pushing them, if there are dogs or deer drives or something like that, deer will try to go um, through that fence and then you have to fix it. Uh, Robert says, use of construction debris as slash piles is going to create major legal problems as an unlicensed C and D landfill. Good point. Um, I hadn't thought of that. I appreciate your adding that in. So before you go out and yes, and it's also, so I'll say the slash walls that we put up are at least for me, not unattractive. I wouldn't want to look at landfill debris as a slash wall or as a debris wall. So I think that's maybe going to have some negative public sentiments. I was thinking more about somebody had mentioned some pallets and we had used some pallets in some places to protect some seedlings. But again, you can't do very much of that. Charlie wants to know if commercial sale and harvest and sale of venison possible, would that help? So probably it would help. I'm told by the people that understand game laws that there are federal laws that prohibit the sale, the interstate transport and sale of wild game. So I think that, so would that be a solution? Maybe, is it feasible? Maybe in the long run, if you're trying to regenerate a forest in the next few years, don't count on that as an option. Julia wants to know if we're not enclosing deer inside the slash wall. Indeed we do. And uh, on, those, on those big harvests, so if you have a couple acres, maybe even up to the nine acres, then we were able to effectively get the deer out of those in the 75 acre harvest. Uh, we had, we trapped deer on the inside. And unfortunately, we usually end up closing up these projects about the time that the does are dropping fawns. And so if, if a doe has a fawn on the inside, it will do anything to be with that fawn. So if the fawn's on the outside, the doe gets out on its own. If the fawn's on the inside, the deer, the doe will find a way in. So we've worked with the state wildlife agency and have deer damage permits that allows us to remove the deer from the inside of the slash wall. Alex wants to know if there's a potential for a fire risk. I think in some areas, in some limited circumstances. In New York and most of the Northeast, it's unusual to have concerns about fire. We just have enough moisture that it's, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to think about using fire as a tool because we don't have good fire season. So could it happen? Probably. Would it happen? Uh, probably not. So, and I'll say for those of you remaining um, foresters and landowners, if you pursue a slash wall, please let Brett or I know. We would love to hear about it. We're happy to help. And we would um, just be interested in carrying on that conversation. Joel points out there's some state laws related to slash and wildfire, and that is indeed the fact. And in some parts of the Adirondacks in New York, that again is the case. All right. I'm going to turn off the recording and thank you all.